we talked about this. I know I mentioned it when I show my atrial lipoma, the myxoma case. Don't confuse it with benign atrial septal fat infiltration, right? And as I said before, I'll read a report and it'll say there's fat density in the left atrium consistent with the myxoma. And I'll roll my eyes and I'll think, man, nine out of 10 times that's going to be this. And so you should not confuse the two, right? This is clearly sessile. And as I described to you before, it'll take that bend around the SVC and, and is clearly not intraluminal on top of it all, right? It's not a pedunculated intraluminal mass. It is fat density, but there the resemblance to an atrial myxoma ends. And look at how this stuff squeezes the SBC. Look at it. You just can't believe that is not physiologically significant, but it isn't. It actually does not result in any kind of problem. It's apparently just warm and gooey and doesn't result in any actual obstruction of the SVC. Look at that, it just pinches it down to almost nothing. So that's benign atrial septal fat. All right, a couple of septal defects. This is my favorite ASD case. And this, with this one, like so many ASD cases, even when they're obvious, the first thing that comes to my attention is the enlargement of the right side of the heart. And that was the case with this. I went, wow, her right side of the heart is big. And I went back up and there you can see it. You've got to have just the right contrast phase uh, to be able to, to see this. And the problem is, of course, uh, we're typically trying to go really early arterial on these coronary CTAs. And so you don't always have enough contrast in the left atrium to, to really give you that jet. But there it is, very nicely depicted. And that's obviously shunting in the right direction. No Eisenmenger here. And you can see the enlargement of the right ventricle. I remember the first time looking at this going, the ventricle's big and it just keeps going. Right? So that is a significantly enlarged right then. Remember, of course, the right atrium will enlarge, the right ventricle will enlarge in ASDs, but you don't see as much right ventricular chamber enlargement with a VSD. You can see hypertrophy, but the chamber itself does not get all that big. All right, and here is a VSD. I like this one because it never really blew, and it really shows you perfectly the location of the membranous portion of the septum. Right, which is right there. And it's just bowing out. It's apparently thin, weak, and redundant, but it's not actually a septal defect because it is containing that left ventricular contrast. So just an interesting case to show you perfectly right below the aortic valve ring, right, is right where that uh, membranous septum lies. All right, let's do some valvular. So. This is a case of left atrial appendage thrombosis. So the left atrial appendage is sitting right there in front of the left PA. And this one is completely filled with thrombus. This can be tricky. There is no question. You can uh, get incomplete filling of the tip of the atrial appendage, and that can make it a very difficult call. But when the whole thing is not filling, that makes it pretty easy. The other thing to note here, is the mitral valve cusps are really thickened and foreshortened. They're completely abnormal. They're even calcified in places. And so this patient had chronic mitral stenosis that resulted in left atrial enlargement and probably stasis in the left atrial appendage. Yeah, so my comment on the ASD, I just realized, the problem with the ASD in contrast is we're always trying to catch really early arterial, right? And if you don't hit it exactly, then you'll have more contrast in the right side of the heart, and that makes it hard to see the shunt. So that's what I was referring to. Sorry, I kind of misspoke there. All right, so look at those valve cusps. That's beautiful on this cine. You can really see that they are thickened and distorted and calcified. And the left atrium is just on the large side. And that all probably resulted in stasis in the LAA with subsequent thrombosis, right? So when it completely will not fill with contrast, that's when you're golden, right? It's when there's, there are wisps of contrast in there mixing with the pectinate muscles, and uh, it can be difficult. And so this is 
a good example of that. This is a tip of the left atrial appendage that's not filling. And this is a very distended left atrial appendage on top of that, might I add. So this one actually turned out not to be a thrombosed uh, atrial appendage. And you can see there are little wisps of contrast working their way into that tip. And so here was the real pathology. This is the uh, queen mother of left atrial myxomas. Again, it's uh, intraluminal, arising from the septum. It's got that little dot of calcification in it, which many of them ultimately do develop. And of course, it's doing my favorite thing, which is causing wrecking ball damage to the mitral valve, right? With each atrial contraction, that thing is smacking against the mitral valve cusps. And it's not surprising that this is a potential cardiac cause of stroke. So look at that wispy stuff. And you can even see the pectinate muscles in the left atrial appendage when we go down through that again. Right there. See them? They're the uh, horizontally oriented lines in the inferior portion there of the LAA. Right there. So those are the pectinate lines. Don't confuse those with uh, wispy strands of thrombus, for instance. Okay, so that is a left atrial myxoma. I spent an entire day, this was back in the days when I had to capture uh, movie images one by one when doing a 3D. And I thought this case was cool enough that I was going to do a special orientation and I, I seriously, I think I spent three hours at a workstation making this movie. So we're going to watch it. So you can actually see we're cutting into the tumor itself. There it is. And there is a dissection of that fatty tumor. You can actually see its effect on the mitral valve cusps right there, spreading them out. All right. So that is a left atrial myxoma. This is just a bicuspid aortic valve. You can see the abnormal configuration. And you've got two relatively normal cusps, but this one little vestigial cusp. And that's common. Uh, oftentimes that third cusp isn't completely absent, but you'll see a little hypoplastic vestige of what should have been the third cusp. So that's a bicuspid aortic valve with a little remnant. And these folks are, of course, at risk for other things, coarcs and other uh, congenital anomalies. That's a nice view showing you the two dominant cusps are coapting there fairly normally. And then there's that one little vestige. All right, so that's a bicuspid aortic valve. This is a severe aortic stenosis, just to show you those calcified, deformed, and probably uh, mostly fused cusps. And then this hypertrophy of the left ventricle, a consequence of the increased resistance to flow that it's been working against. So you can really appreciate those cusps do practically uh, appear fused. Now remember, in the typical situation, we're doing this in late diastole on a coronary CTA. So you should have an open mitral valve and a closed aortic valve. That's the normal situation. And it's important to keep that in mind, right? Because that means mitral stenosis, you're gonna have a shot at, right? Depending on how uh, wide and mobile the mitral valve cusps appear. Aortic stenosis, probably not, right? The aortic valve should be closed. Conversely, calling mitral regurge on coronary CTA is tough, right? Because you, you would need to have it uh, with the valve closed to really identify that. And similarly, aortic regurge on coronary CTA is actually easy to call because you will see that the valves, uh, the valve cusps do not coapt properly in aortic regurge because the valve will be closed. So you can't really say that these valves are fused because the valve should be closed, but you can certainly infer some degree of it, uh, not only because of the appearance of those cusps, but because of the significant hypertrophy of the left ventricle. All right, and there it is on coronal. It just doesn't look like those are that mobile, does it? All right, so that is aortic stenosis. So here is aortic regurge. 
Now you've got a big dilated aortic root and look at those valve cusps. That valve is closed and yet you can see that triangular gap in the center where they are not properly coapting, thus resulting in aortic regurge. So there is massive dilation of the aortic root and there's significant dilation of the left heart. So this is the classic core bovinum, right? And the worse it gets, the worse it gets, right? Because the stroke volume is ever increasing and that increases the dilation of the aorta, which worsens the failure to coapt of the aortic cusps and worsens the mitral regurge, right? So this is a, uh, a vicious cycle that these patients get into. So that is aortic regurgitation with core bovinum. Yeah, I was disappointed. I showed this as a Jeopardy case one time and everybody just kept writing aortic aneurysm and nobody would put aortic regurge. Uh, so I took it out of, the, uh, out of that set. All right, and this is another entity that I mentioned to you before. We looked at that case of an aortic ring abscess. Right, and they present with what? Heart block. Yes, so <laughs> here is a very similar case. This is just on a gated study, and this is one where we're treated to a view of the actual uh, infectious vegetation. So this is the ring abscess. This is contrast dissecting into the, uh, basically the region of the endocardial cushion, right? Right adjacent to the aortic valve ring. And then here, on the upstream side of the aortic valve, as previously mentioned, is the infectious vegetation. Truly bizarre, but when you see something on the downstream end, start thinking pedunculated tumor like a fibroelastoma, which can arise from the valves. Uh, it, if you're going to call it infectious vegetation in the aortic valve, it ought to be upstream. Uh, in the mitral valve, I've seen them, uh, honestly, because of the motion of the mitral valve, it will whip vegetations downstream, upstream, et cetera. So it doesn't hold true for the mitral valve. But in the aortic valve, where you don't have that kind of valve motion, these go upstream, right? And there is a significant fluid collection. Most of these patients have a pericardial fluid collection, and that in this setting is typically going to be a pyopericardium. Ugh. All right, this patient had a bicuspid valve too, by the way, which you may notice right there. And that may have actually set him up for uh, endocarditis. Obviously there were other factors, but you know, when you have an abnormal aortic valve, it does uh, create altered dynamics from the optimal. And so anytime there are altered dynamics, you can get endothelial disruption from various jet lesions, and it can actually set you up for endocarditis and other, other difficulties. All right, so there's the bicuspid valve, and then you can see the ring abscess immediately inferior to the valve ring, and then that irregular pedunculated vegetation sticking upstream into the aortic outflow tract. Did a 3D on this one, just so you can see that uh, vegetation right there. It's a, it's a pretty neat view of it. I think I circle it this time through. So there's that vegetation in the aortic outflow tract. All right, so that's aortic endocarditis. A few myocardial ones. I mentioned this finding before when we looked at a non-gated ARVD. So this is a rhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And look at the fatty infiltration and thickening of that right ventricle. Don't mistake it for pericardial fat, which is right adjacent. You can see those little wisps of right ventricular myocardium interspersed there, but it's almost complete fatty replacement. The other thing to note here is that there is focal left ventricular thinning as well. And so I mentioned before, this is a progressive disease. It initially involves the right ventricle, but it actually, in, in a significant percentage of patients, will progress over time and can come to involve the left ventricular myocardium as well. So there is the fatty replacement and thickening of the right ventricular myocardium. And you can see those irregular regions of thinning in the left ventricular myocardium there. And uh, again, more inferiorly as well, right in there. 
All right, so that is ARVD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia.